I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined by Peter Gerritsen, independent strategy consultant focusing on space and defense. Peter's accomplishments include a 33-year career at the Department of Defense and service in a number of prestigious roles, such as the Chief of Future Technology for the USAF Strategic Planning Group in the Pentagon, the Director of Space Horizons Task Force, and the Division Chief of Irregular Strategy, Plans, and Policy, and is a Strategic Policy Advisor to the Chief of Staff of the Air Force. Peter has also served as an assistant professor of comparative military studies at US, USAF Air Command and Staff College, and as a member of the National Space Society Board of Directors, and in his current role as a senior fellow in defense studies at the American Foreign Policy Council. Pete, that was a mouthful. Welcome, sir. Welcome. Uh, so for the audience's sake, I, I want to mention that we, again, first met probably about 15 years ago. And at that time, you were serving as what I understood to be the chief futurist of the Air Force. Um, what can you tell me about that role and some of the others that you've had that, that we just went through? So that role was a really a fantastic job. So the Air Force was never bad to me. I, I had a series of terrific assignments but this was really the first assignment that I had stepping out of an operational role. So I'd flown the C-9 Nightingale, and then I flew the C-5 Galaxy. And this was my first uh, chance to actually serve in sort of a thinking capacity at headquarters Air Force. And I, I couldn't have been uh, happier being in that place uh, in future concepts and having an opportunity to think about the really the long-term problems of our nation, our, our, our remit was essentially to focus, you know, sort of 30 to 50 years out in the future. Um, and, you know, it was, a, it was just a wonderful assignment where literally every day I had some innovative mind from one of our national labs banging on my door to tell me about some piece of tech or science that they were working on that had the uh, potential to completely impact, you know, our, our way of fighting or what we would have to worry about or our national security in some exciting way. And, and in many ways, I still sort of feel like, you know, I, I've already seen, you know, the future and I'm just sort of waiting for it to very slowly arrive. Yeah, I, well, absolutely. And the things that you've told me over the years, I mean, there are so many amazing things that are on their way here. So, well, so now you, you have retired from the Air Force and now you're working in a more academic capacity. I'm wondering, what can you tell me about your current pursuits and future ambitions, I guess, in that context? So, you know, what I would say is uh, really starting with that assignment uh, and the time that you and I met, I really became strongly convinced that the major opportunities both for our nation and for the broader human civilization uh, lay out in space. And that um, we needed to be significantly more aggressive about going there. And it was clear to me that for structural reasons, we were not uh, moving as fast. Uh, we were not applying the resources that we had within national security space to the problem. And part of the solution to that, uh, in, in my view, was certainly to have a dedicated space-focused uh, military branch. Um, and we're halfway there with the Space Force. You know, the, the designed vision was a fully independent department uh, with a much broader role and mandate. But the Space Force, uh, as it is, you know, a, a separate military service within the Department of the Air Force is a good you know, place to pick up momentum to actually have some control over budget and personnel and focus. And it's led to a lot of great work and work, you know, thinking about the future of space that honestly would not have happened had it not been for the Space Force. But, uh, you know, while I try, you know, my best to, to keep my fingers in, uh, in, in consulting to help them think about the future, uh, in my think tank role, I try very hard, you know, to articulate uh, the, the big picture, um, you know, at the apex of our policymaking environment to sort of uh, speak directly to Congress and the American people on the uh, 
uh, the opportunities and benefits that could exist in space and why it's worthy of our investment and, and trying to design a, uh, an agenda for the nation that, that, that's worthy of our nation and that adequately respects you know, what sort of values you know, we, we should uh, continue on from our founding fathers and you know, what, you know, where the dangers lie and also just uh, partly, again, because of that wonderful initial exposure as a, you know, as a mid-career officer to, you know, just a huge amount of technology that is not really in the public space to try to make it clear to policymakers what is in the realm of the possible and why those investments could matter to the future of American power and really to the future of uh, freedom for all humanity. Well, now, Pete, in terms of the Space Force, I really view you as one of the key figures that helped define what the Space Force could be and should be before it was created, right? And so I guess the thing that I should ask is, you know, now that it's it's starting to emerge on its own, what are your thoughts on the progress of it? How do you see things going so far with the new the new sixth branch of the military? Well, success has many fathers, and uh, you know, and of course, you know, you 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 know, as a as a parent, uh, you have to you know look at a uh, you know, it, the space force is a is a two year old, right? It's a toddler, you know. It is just starting to walk, um, you know. It, it's just really starting to get any sort of sense, you know, of a separate identity. So. You know, I'll try to be balanced in what I thought. So, you know, first of all, you know, what I and others had in mind, you know, was something, you know, much more ambitious from the start, right? We really wanted uh, a, a very sort of entrepreneurial startup kind of, you know, mentality. Uh, we wanted, you know, to make it make as clear as possible a, uh, a, a discontinuity with um, you know, what we'd previously been doing in military space. And, um, and I don't think that we reached uh, as far as, as could have been. Um, you know, I think, you know, what, what we have seen, you know, initially was a um, hesitant steps to embrace the idea and mostly an attempt to to carry over, you know, what we were already doing in military space, um, that and to sort of stay as close and tethered to the Department of the Air Force as possible, and you know, a lot of that was because of internal politics um, and culture. But on the other hand, uh, so I mean, I guess in terms of like messaging and. Uh, you know, providing a vision to the to the American public, I think we are two years behind where we could have been. But on the other hand, you know, on the bright side, uh, I think we have to appreciate how much has actually been accomplished, and how that how laying that concrete is going to matter in the future. So, um, first of all, let's talk about why the Space Force structurally is a big deal no matter where it's at. So before the Space Force, you had, uh, if, you, if the nation wanted to talk about military or national security space, it was buried as a major command within the Air Force itself. And all the promotion capabilities, everything that those officers were taught, all the control of the budget, was in the hands of an Air Force that was pursuing, you know, trying its best to maximize its resource value for air and space together, with air being the biggest part. And so that led to a particular way of looking at space um, as basically a little, little higher, a little faster, looking down on the earth, not considering any of the economic opportunities. Um, considering Space Force careers mostly in the context of an Air Force officer progression. It did not control its own budget, 
and the the apex of uh, of Air Force space leadership did not have the kind of standing uh, on the Joint Requirements Oversight Council, which is where military requirements for acquisition are formed. Uh, it did not have a separate combatant command that was articulating uh, requirements for the domain itself. You did not have a space person providing direct input to the president as one of the members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And similarly, you did not have an equivalent uh, you know, standing before Congress arguing for resources. So all that has changed, right? Today, you know, space sits at the same table in terms of requirements, sits at the same table in terms of suggesting you know, options, in terms of planning, in, in terms of resourcing, they control their own budget, uh, they are, you know, in the midst of controlling their own personnel system, and they're starting, you know, uh, too slow, in my opinion, uh, to be able to control their own uh, uh, relations with uh, Congress and uh, the media via public affairs. So, you know, along this line, other very important things have happened. So, first of all, there's been tremendous excitement about the fact that there is a new branch. And that excitement has translated to entirely different recruiting. So you have to understand that within the Air Force, um, people, it, it did, you did not necessarily attract the best talent into the space side because the hero system in the Air Force pushed you into being a pilot. You know, that was the, the road to, uh, uh, to promotion. And so, you know, people with talent uh, would be steered in that direction if their eyesight, you know, was good, even if their natural inclination, and even if their academic training was in astronautical engineering. So the fact that there's now a separate track that, that appreciates space, and, and moreover, that this is something ground floor and new, has attracted this immense amount, almost a crushing amount of applications and talent. And it's talent of a different sort because the sort of people that want to join have this entrepreneurial idea of wanting to get in on, on the ground floor. And that's going to lead to a, a kind of dynamic culture. And there are numerous examples of young uh, Space Force officers that have displayed enormous initiative, you know, that I find extremely exciting. So the other thing that I think is really, you know, fantastic is that, and this was part of my design bet, right? My design bet was once you create a separate bureaucracy whose mandate is to focus on space, that it would naturally come to similar conclusions that those of us who had looked at space as its own domain, you know, as military academics or, you know, as, you know, strategists had come to. And in fact, I think there's strong evidence that, that this is happening, that the uh, Chief Technology and Innovation Office has run a series of these Space Futures workshops um, that I, in my view, have been among the most forward-looking um, uh, events uh, that I witnessed across, you know, my, my entire career in the Department of Defense, you know, they've explored multiple scenarios reaching all the way up to 2060, uh, you know, very, very different sorts of assumptions in the different worlds about the speed of technology, the speed of, uh, you know, how fast humans are able to move in and whether or not they can, you know, even form you know, uh, you know, space stations or whether or not they can have settlements like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are talking about. You know, they've really considered, uh, you know, what might happen with propulsion technology. Are they very conservative? What might happen with making money? Uh, what might happen with US leadership, you know, or, or other powers eclipsing? And then within that, they've started to think about like, hey, what would this mean for our future roles and missions? And what would that mean for our future technological structure? And so what, what, I, you know, what I've witnessed happening is that you've gone from like literally a tiny cadre, like, you know, like 
maybe five to 10 people who'd really thought about this and were at the core of thinking about the need for a space force, you know, to now, you know, at, at least 150, you know, people who, you know, have, are now thinking on these terms and appreciate both the, uh, the necessity, you know, and the value that space brings to the, to the United States and our allies and partners and their national security equities today, as well as, you know, what we need to anticipate that, uh, you know, that appears within the realm of the possible given the, uh, the stated ambitions of US industry and sort of the, the space billionaires and, and their vision, as well as the vision of our competitors. So that will take a while to percolate you know, through the institution and that's fine because it's not gonna happen tomorrow. We've got you know, plenty of time, um, but, uh, but in my view, you know, these are the big things that have happened, right? You have got standing for space in, in an organizational sense. Um, you have control of the budget and personnel and those things themselves open up new opportunities that's bringing in, bringing in this terrific, ambitious new talent uh, with, with, whose minds are open to many different ideas. And then the institution, because of its mandate to think about space, is now thinking very broadly about space and displaying just phenomenal thought leadership, in my view. And, and I look forward to the next step, which is when that thought leadership that's happening in the CTIO starts to display itself in the posture statements and the public statements of the of the apex space force leadership mm. well now pete one of the things that i really want to touch on and again this comes a lot out of uh, you helping to define this is this blue water versus brown water role and opportunities for the Space Force, right? And that's something that you've described in past interviews, but I was wondering if you could touch on that again briefly and, you know, basically help the audience understand what those terms mean. And so far with the Space Force, where are they at? Do you see their trajectory focusing more on either one of these roles or has that not really been defined yet, I guess, in terms of where they're going? All right, so this, uh, this is, um, you know, and I'll, and I'll credit uh, uh, General Pete Warden and Brent Zarnick with sort of um, coming up with this distinction, right? And this is, this is based on an analogy to uh, naval power and naval theory. So some navals, navies, usually continental navies, basically think about navies as peripheral forces that support ground efforts and might be used to like move, you know, or perhaps, you know, deny somebody else's ability to, you know, bring in uh, land forces. And so they hug the coasts uh, and they're principally concerned with what's happening on and in the neighborhood of the coasts. Blue water uh, navies are navies that are concerned with uh, possessions uh, and uh, economic places of interest far from uh, their home port. So the United States Navy today, um, and really almost since its, uh, since its formal inception has been a blue water navy. You know, we, we did not, although we, we had uh, we have used our Navy at times in groundwater uh, capacities. When we actually authorized the Navy, we were concerned with the Barbary pirates preying on American uh, commerce. And so, you know, not in support of a, you know, military campaign at home, but to protect our ability to have free trade abroad, we, you know, purchased these frigates and went, you know, all the way to the other side of the Atlantic and the Mediterranean uh, in order to uh, punish the Barbary pirates in such a way that we could reliably be a trading nation. And so, you know, and Britain had, of course, been a, a blue water space power and they had, you know, controlled and patrolled the lines of commerce. And that allowed them to do, you know, even uh, uh, very benevolent things like shutting down the, the slave trade and not allowing that to, uh, you know, to move upon the open waters. 
So, you know, these are different traditions of naval thought, and they get, you know, they sort of developed, or, or it's come to have this connotation with space that brown water space power is space power in support of joint terrestrial forces. It is, it is things like GPS and overhead imagery and military satellite communication and missile warning that basically supports armies, navies, and air forces on planet Earth. And to be fair, this is the majority of what space power uh, is today because we don't yet have possessions uh, and economic value in space. But it's important to realize that the, the folks that were arguing for a separate space force, for the most part, we're not arguing for a separate space force in order to do, you know, joint operations on planet Earth better. Um, the, the fundamental argument was that there was this vast frontier of economic opportunity uh, that was going to affect the, uh, the power and wealth of nations. And that if the United States wanted to be, uh, wanted to maintain a preeminent position, it needed to be serious about going after those. And in order to be serious about going after those, you needed something, uh, you needed a mix of capabilities, right? The first and foremost, you need some type of uh, exploration uh, capability like NASA. Uh, now in the early United States, that was also performed you know, by, the, by the military. You know, we had, Lewis and Clark was a military you know, expedition. We, surveyed the poles with military ex expeditions. Um, you know, the, both the Navy and Air Force, you know, had a role in surveying, you know, the world. But, you know, through an accident of history, you know, we have NASA that's doing that today. And, and I think that's fine. There's no need to change that. Then you need something akin to a frontier development agency. And again, you know, we had important roles in the military through the Corps of Engineers, and then later the CBs and you know Air Force Civil Engineers, uh, you know that helped build initial infrastructure that helped sort of establish you know bases at the outset, um, and then you need to have uh, you know both sort of in a medium like space you need to have technology development for mobility, but fundamentally you need to have a national you know. Uh, a transportation system for national needs, and you need to have the ability to support and protect commerce at its distant periphery. And this looks very different from major war. If you think about, you know, what it's like when great powers compete at the edges of their logistics, um, in our own history, you know, of European competition in the New World, you had, you know, the uh, decisions that took place over whether or not the French were going to have a colony, you know, on the East Coast with, you know, less than 200 soldiers essentially deciding, you know, whether or not you were going to have a, a, a presence there and whether or not you were going to be able to defend it. Similarly, you know, when the, the Dutch lost Manhattan, you know, lost New York, you know, this, this was a very small, you know, uh, number of naval ships that, you know, they were un, unprepared to defend against. And, you know, they lost what is, you know, today probably the most valuable, you know, uh, real estate. So, you know, you have to think about the fact that you might put a tremendous amount of effort into building a industrial facility, you know, on some place like the moon or an asteroid. And if you don't have some level of, uh, of military force, somebody can just come and coerce it away from you. And you may not be able to, to keep that. Um, and this doesn't require, you know, some, you know, massive all out war. It just requires that they're able to sit there with some level of force and you're not able to meet or, or break that. And so, you know, if you, if you anticipate, you know, that this is not just going to be, you know, 
some, you know, money sucking, you know, uh, expedition like an Arctic lab, right? But at one, but at some point, is actually being designed to have, you know, a, a cost payback. Then, uh, and and here I'll just pause to say that, you know, why would I think that? Uh, you know, why would I think that this is even worth contemplating? Well, uh, and those who are interested are, are, you know, welcome to read the argument in full in, in my book with Dr. Namrata Goswami, uh, Scramble for the Skies. But in essence, the inner solar system provides like a million fold of resources on Earth could support, you know, more than a trillion human beings and has, you know, energy that's way more than you know a billion fold more than we we have on earth and so you know human beings are really good in the long term at exploiting uh natural resources and you know yes there are a number of steps to get there but these steps are things that are truly within our control you know they we know how to uh harvest solar energy we use it from I think just about every satellite today. Uh, we know how to do industrial processes. You know, we have a good idea about how to do vacuum processes. We have a very long history of mining. We're getting better at, you know, robotics all the time. And so the idea that these resources are going to be, you know, locked away forever uh, strikes me as implausible. And nations get really, really concerned over even a fraction of a percent of GDP. And they worry about whether or not somebody's, you know, getting ahead or growing in GDP. And the, the economic frontier of the inner solar system is so many times vaster than what is available on Earth that it, you know, it, I just don't think that it is responsible not to have a national strategy that considers the economic and therefore also the coercive and military power that's resident in space. And if you want to play in that game, you have to design your institutions to be able to go after them. Yeah. And so that requires apex United States government design of the uh, of the policies and the vision for where you want to go. And that's where I try to play in my think tank role. And then it requires institutions that deliberately go out and explore, not just for science, but explore to map resources like uh, the Viper probe is going to do on the lunar south pole. Um, and then, you know, it requires institutions that are starting to think about and develop the capacity to be able to protect, uh, you know, and hopefully just protect by being there, by being there, you know, in force to say, hey, don't mess with us because we can mess with you back. Um, but that's what we mean by blue water space power. It is a space power that is thinking ahead uh, and building the tools to be able to ensure you know, much like the cavalry protected the wagon trains and protected the transcontinental railroad and the infrastructure, uh, and before that, even the canal system, you know, you have got uh, a, a whole of nation effort to move out uh, to gain greater prosperity. And part of that whole of nation effort is a supporting effort uh, of your national security uh, you know, uh, space capabilities to make sure that you are able to benefit and keep what you've spent an enormous amount of treasure to go out and get. Yeah. Well, now, so I, I, I want to jump in. You actually, you mentioned Scramble for the Skies. I just want to highlight that. That's your book, Scramble for the Skies. You co-authored that with Dr. Namrata Goswami, and that's about the emerging space economy. So people can get that. Uh, they can get that on Amazon, right? And I'll put some links in the interview as well. Um, 
I also want to talk about the Space Strategy Podcast. This is a more recent endeavor of yours. It includes a mixture of futurism and expert interviews with visionaries and leaders in the field. So in terms of the podcast, this is something that I'm newer to. Um, what are some of the highlights of this? And, and I guess, uh, where can people subscribe to this? Because I, I've seen this on Apple Podcasts. They could probably listen on Android as well. But, um, you know, where are some of the places they could find it? I will, again, drop some links in there. And why should they be listening to this? Who are the people you're talking to? What are the important topics? All right. So you're right. It, it is on Apple Podcasts. And uh, I think you can get it on almost any other podcast platform uh, because it seems to, uh, the service that we have seems to send it out very broadly. Um, so, you know, why might you want to listen? I guess, you know, here, here was what I encountered, right? You don't initially realize how far you've departed from uh, a, a paradigm until you start trying to explain the conclusions to someone else and they start giving you blank stares, right? And part of that is, you know, you, you realize that your own mindset slowly accumulates from many conversations that you've had with many people. And, uh, and I realized that, you know, my own thinking about space had been shaped by a number of conversations I'd had with just brilliant luminaries who, you know, got to many of these places before me. And, and I wanted to sort of recreate a bunch of those conversations for the public so that they could sort of come along, you know, on, on this journey to sort of see, you know, uh, you know, where, where does this, you know, how do people get to these ideas, right? How, how do you get to a world where asteroid mining and lunar mining is not crazy, where space solar power, you know, is not crazy, uh, you know, where, uh, you know, there, where you have, you know, where you can seriously imagine expanse like capabilities. And so, um, you know, that was part of it. You know, the other was that I thought, you know, that my experience had been that there are a, an enormous diversity of visionary ideas about space that are just not in the public space. They were not in the public discussions. They were certainly not in the policy discussions. And so I felt that that was making our policy discussions uh, anemic and, uh, and shortchanging the nation of the opportunity to have a strategy discussion at the highest levels. So I have tried very hard to pick the people who I thought had the biggest ideas, um, ideas that you know sometimes were very different than mine that I you know don't necessarily agree to. But at least, you know, have been, you know, significant enough for me to go home and grapple with and think, well, could they be right? Or, you know, where, where you know, where does, you know, where do I agree with them and where do I not agree with them? And I've tried to create a format that really gives them the broadest floor and a long enough time to fully develop the discussion. So there is a lot in the podcast about cutting edge space technology, about space policy discussions, about where the nation should go. You know, we cover asteroid mining and lunar development and nuclear thermal propulsion and, you know, where NASA is going and the space economy and what China is up to. So, you know, there's a, there's a tremendous diversity and I try to go after the biggest, most important questions we can talk about. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes complete sense. Well, so you've mentioned the private sector several times, and I know that that's something with the podcast as well as Scramble for the Skies, you're, you're talking about not only the military sector, but the private sector and the intersection between those two. How do you see that emerging? How do you see that evolving? Because part of this blue water role that you've mentioned for the Space Force includes uh, 
providing protection and support for this emerging private sector in space. And folks like Elon Musk are pushing forward very rapidly to create a private sector for space. How, how, do, you, how do you see that evolving, I guess? Well, at the moment, I'm pretty bullish. Uh, I would say that this is one of the areas where I think uh, the Space Force and the Department of Defense are, I think, making serious progress. So let's talk about what this was like you know, circa 2015. So in 2015-ish, um, we were doing work for what was called the Fast Space Study. And I can remember, uh, well, I should back up and say that General Gloss, who uh, you know, sort of um, championed and, and authorized that, that effort at Air University, uh, you know, was a was a very forward thinking thought leader on on space. And one of the things that we were trying to do at Air University at the time with the uh, Space Horizons Task Force was to try to reimagine, you know, we, we'd heard, as you said, all this talk from the private sector, I think many of which had not taken in the DoD had not taken seriously, we'd sort of thought about it as, oh, this is a marketing campaign. And so uh, you know, whereas most people, you know, e either dismissed it or put it in not my job jar, uh, you know, talk about, you know, O'Neillian settlements or, you know, settling Mars or, you know, lots of people, you know, in space or even at the time, <laughs> reusable rockets and, uh, you know, and mega constellations, right? When we, when we were looking at those ideas in 2015, you know, they were, they were in the, you know, that, that's not really a credible idea uh, phase. So, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, we were lucky enough to have a terrific team and our team went around and, and, and talked to these folks and we were interested in asking different questions, right? The, the first question, you know, is like, if you take this seriously, where does this lead us? How does this change U.S. interests? How does this change the roles and missions of the space, you know, what well, wasn't the Space Force at the time, uh, but the, the Department of Defense. Um, you know, where, is, where does success in these things lead us? And then what is a good partnering role for, you know, at the time it was the, the, the Air Force and the Department of Defense. So we, uh, you know, we were coming into the companies with these questions of like, where do you think you're going? Why do you think you'll be successful? If you're there, what do you need from us? If this is a place the United States wants to go, what could we do to help make you more successful, right? And they told us that that was a completely different conversation, you know, than they'd ever had. That, you know, whenever they talked to Air Force people, it was like, what can you do to fulfill my existing requirements? And there wasn't this broader strategic conversation you know, about aligning where things were going. Well, since the Space Force has come of age, I think a lot of people are asking those questions. Um, you know, you can see it in just the fact that, you know, now, you know, people talk about it and are curious about where VCs are investing. You know, there's a lot more conversation about public-private partnerships. You have just a whole number of, of different approaches that, you know, existed before the effort. So you've got the Space Development Agency that's trying to purchase mass numbers of satellites in these different tranches. You have an attempt by Space Systems Command to reinvent itself. You have this, you know, AFWorks and SpaceWorks, and you have a you have a uh, you have a consortium effort. Um, and across the board, people are starting to ask and think about these externalities. And certainly that's a case in the Space Futures Workshop as well, that these externalities. Now, I would not say that, you know, the, the entire institution is converted over to this, uh, you know, to the idea that it, it is, well, let me back it up. That this is an enormous sea change, right? But I think it's still hard because of the historical roles that that folks have played. Um, those who have been around for a while um, tend to see a, or, or tend to have been socialized into a different role for public 
private uh, roles and responsibilities, right? So for a number of reasons, um, including misdeeds along you know, the way, uh, the, uh, you know, the tendency for, for uh, of the military is to be, you know, hands off and like, I'll consider it when it arrives. And I, it's not my job to worry about externalities. And, and it's also not my job to worry about, you know, if you want to go do something risky, you know, it's not my job to, you know, to come and save you, right? So that's kind of a uh, or, or there's the thought that I'm within my stovepipe, so it's not my job to design the larger enterprise. That, that's somebody else's job, right? But I think, you know, where we are moving to, uh, you know, is already a sense that if somebody is going to uh, protect America's national security equities, they can't fail to consider the industrial base, and they can't fail to consider what commercial is, is doing and where that's going to be, and that they have to be in a position to articulate and steer and help the, the apex leadership of the United States understand the national security equities and design the right incentives. So I think you are seeing a uh, a, a slow change in what it means to be a national security professional and that part of it is architecting a whole of nation industrial base and incentive structure because there are, you know, as Mahan says, there are, you know, positions you can achieve in peacetime with commerce that you could never achieve in wartime with military force. And so, you know, part of having a dominant space power is to make sure that your commerce is able to build, you know, a logistics and industrial structure uh, that gets your nation wealth and provides the strength and might that that allows you to defend itself, uh, you know, and keep the United States militarily strong. Um, so I, I think that I think we are witnessing that change unfold. And I think that's extremely healthy because there is no, uh, you know, when you really think about what great powers have to do to be a great power, um, you have to be able to, you know, essentially project military power, you know, today across the world, but, you know, at, at great distances, wherever your interests lie, and there aren't many countries that can that can do that. Um, and the United States couldn't do that just, you know, with some Navy ships, you know, we would, we, we need to have bases, you know, those bases have to have, you know, fuel, they have to have parts. Back at home, you have to have factories, you have to have shipyards, you have, you know, there, there's this entire industrial chain, you know, that is behind any kind of military power. And at the same time, you know, you, you only require that kind of military power because you have economic interests at the periphery that affect, you know, everybody that, that has to be protected. And in the process, you gain, you know, allies that, you know, that have territorial interests that need defending, that, you know, have to be protected from coercion, you know, whether it be a naval blockade or, you know, uh, any number of gray zone type of uh, uh, aggressions. So did I answer your question there? I'm yeah, sure yeah, did. absolutely. Absolutely. And so, you know, we're, we're actually, I'm coming to the end of my questions, but I do want to close by asking what comes next for you? Where are things going for Pete Gerritsen as you move forward? Because again, I mean, you've helped push so many boundaries in helping to define I mean, the emerging space economy, the emerging space force, where things are going and where things should go for space. Where are things going for you? So I'm, uh, you know, I'm, this past year has been a very good year. You know, we uh, are, Scramble for the Skies got academic title of the year, which was, you know, phenomenal. 
And uh, I was extremely happy, you know, to play a role as the editor for the State of the Space Industrial Base 2021, which I think is among the best statements about uh, where uh, U.S. national whole government uh, national space strategy should go, signed, I should say, by both the chief of space operations and the NASA administrator. Um, so a lot of what I'd like is to see the, the concepts in those actually move into policy. And so AFPC is working on that. We're, you know, uh, we're sort of summarizing, you know, what we've learned from the podcasts into a, into a book that's targeted at Congress. And then, you know, in addition to that, there are um, sort of, there, there are several big ideas um, that I don't think have really made it as far as they need to make it. So one, you know, is uh, planetary defense. So, you know, we have, uh, we still do not have a working policy structure and planetary defense technical capability, uh, you know, to protect ourselves from, you know, asteroids and comets. And we don't even know really whose responsibility that would be or what is the responsibilities, you know, that U.S. Space Command and U.S. Space Force should be in that mix. I'm delighted to see that in this upcoming February uh, uh, tabletop exercise that both uh, U.S. Space Command and U.S. Space Force are going to be participating. That's a big deal. It hasn't been done before. And uh, kudos, of course, to Lindley Johnson and Leviticus Lewis at, uh, uh, at NASA's Planetary Defense Coordination Office for taking leadership to make that happen. Uh, you know, a second thing that I think is just absolutely critical, you know, to, you know, our future, both on this planet and our future off planet, is to, you know, create a national program in space, space solar power. I think, you know, you, you will see something coming out of, uh, out of my think tank, um, making uh, uh, a case for that um, in the, in the next month or two. Um, and so hopefully, you know, that will come, you know, I you know, related to that is, uh, is the national effort on uh, uh, on orbit servicing assembly and manufacturing. And I would say that those two, well, three, three interlocking parts are sort of the keys to the solar system. You know, on the one hand is large, fully reusable launch, like, it, like Elon Musk is working on with Starship. Second is the access to space resources via space mining or what's called in situ resource utilization. And then the last piece is the ability to, you know, assemble and manufacture things in space. And you bring those together, that makes a big deal. And then the last thing is, of course, um, you also need compact power sources that work uh, you know, for very fast propulsion, you know, um, the, you know, that is able to move you around the solar system. And so there is a, there, there's a real need for national investment in nuclear space, space nuclear power and propulsion of both, well, of multiple flavors, right? Um, you need space reactors for surface power, for in-space power, a lot of potential, you know, uh, of, of in-space nuclear reactors, which by the way, are much safer to launch even than radioisotope uh, generators that we use on our deep space probe because they're, the reactor's not active until it's uh, firmly on orbit. And then, um, you know, uh, nuclear uh, thermal rockets have a lot of possibility, essentially twice the efficiency of a, of a chemical rocket that opens up fast transit, you know, to Mars and the inner solar system, or to, you know, intercept a, a, a threatening asteroid or comet. And then, you know, uh, there's also a need to sort of be thinking about uh, uh, space fusion uh, propulsion in particular. There are companies out there that have really, really uh, exciting ideas that would essentially give us, you know, uh, the, the kind of rapid access to the solar system that you see in the expanse. And these things just, they don't move without some level of 
uh, government investment or at least government interest that stimulates the private sector in investment. So those are some key uh, investments that I think need to be much larger in our, in our national thinking. It can't just be about going back to the moon uh, without a vision for lunar industrialization. Um, and it can't just be about you know, going to Mars you know, without a, a much broader sense of how do you scale that? How do you scale that to you know, a, a you know, colony and then a state you know, a, a, a state in our union. How do you think about, you know, the asteroid, you know, belt, not as a place you visit with a science probe, but as a place where you're getting massive amounts of material. And how do you transition from just thinking about spaces, you know, a bunch of cameras that help you track clouds for climate change, uh, you know, to a, a bunch of in-space solar power satellites that, that actually provide 24 hour green energy and allow you to actually address the, uh, you know, the, the atmospheric carbon um, at the same time that you allow, you know, the, the growth in energy for the developing world to have a first world lifestyle. Wonderful. Pete, let me thank you again for your time and for your many, many years of service and for your expertise in this area as well. So thank you, sir. Thank you, Tim.